You know, there's a lot of Christians who say, who cares if the earth's thousands or billions of years old? Why does it matter if God created in six days? It's got nothing to do with the gospel. You know, it's just a side issue. You know what? There's all sorts of other issues we need to be dealing with. The gender issue, the marriage issue, gay marriage, uh, the euthanasia issue, the abortion issue. We need to be dealing with those issues. We, we just need to be out there preaching the gospel, not worrying about the length of the creation days. So people have different interpretations. So what? You know, I was being interviewed on radio once by a minister and he said to me, look, you agree that people can have different views of eschatology, pre-mill, post-mill, R-mill, windmill, treadmill. I mean, there's a lot of different views of eschatology. There's different views of baptism, sprinkling, immersion, different views about speaking in tongues, different views about the Sabbath day. I said, yeah, that's true. They do. And he said, and they have different views about Genesis. It's the same thing. And I said, no, it is not the same thing and this is the point we need to understand you think about it when you have different views about eschatology baptism speaking in tongues sabbath day and obviously somebody's wrong right but you think about it we're looking at scripture and we're arguing from scripture but the reason we have different views of genesis is because we're starting outside of scripture with what the secular world teaches to take their view based on naturalism because the idea of millions of years came from the belief in the 1700s and 1800s from, from uh, those who wanted to explain everything without God that the layers were laid down over millions of years that's where the millions of years came from and we're trying to add it into the Bible and change what it said we're trying to reinterpret it based on outside ideas and people that is the issue with the six days that's what it's all about because you see, back in the 1700s and 1800s, when there were those who were atheists and deists who wanted to explain everything without God, said these rock layers took millions of years to get there, many of our church leaders said, okay, we'll take those millions of years and we'll add them into the Bible. We'll put them before verse 1 or in verse 1 or we'll put them between verse 1 and verse 2 or we'll put them in the days of creation. And then... Along came Darwinian evolution and Darwin popularized his idea that one kind of animal change into another. And there are many Christians who said, oh, we can take that and the idea that ape-like creatures turned into people and we'll add that into the Bible. And so different ideas started to, uh, started to develop such as, well, there's the gap theory and then there's the day-age theory and then there's theistic evolution and along came Sir Fred Hoyle who coined the term the Big Bang. And over the years, as you go around, you'll find within the church there are all these different views in regard to Genesis. Gap theory, day-age theory, theistic evolution, day-gap day, framework hypothesis, press of creation, Adam is a metaphor for his role, the cosmic temple and inauguration view, humans from animals with amnesia, which is a particular view out there. That's a view that, hey, there was millions of years of death and bloodshed and God took two uh, ape creatures and put them in a garden and then made them into Adam and Eve and gave them amnesia so they didn't remember the death and bloodshed. So when they saw death and bloodshed, it was a result of their sin. Do you know what's interesting? See, I, I go to churches sometimes and someone will say, oh, our pastor believes in the gap theory. And uh, someone will say, oh, one of our elders is a theistic evolutionist. Oh, we have people in our church that believe in the day-age theory. Oh, we have others that are progressive creationists like, like Hugh Ross. Oh, we have, we have others here that uh, believe in the cosmic temple inauguration view of John Walton and so on. And then they say to me, what's your view? And I say, oh, the biblical one. Do you realize none of them come from the Bible? They all have one thing in, in common. Do you know what their one thing is in common? Every one of them have one thing in common. To fit millions of years somehow into the Bible. You know what's interesting? Sometimes I pick up some of these books or these papers written by some of these theologians and it might be a hundred pages of complex Hebrew and stuff which I don't understand, and I flick through it until I find the footnote that says, thus we can fit the dinosaur age and millions of years into the Bible in this point. And I don't need to read the rest of the paper. I know what their whole motivation is. Their whole motivation is to try to fit millions of years in. And you see, what I find is a lot of them, they really don't understand the word science because here's what I find from a lot of our Christian academics. Oh yeah, I know the Bible says that, but because of science it can't mean that. But see, that's where we have to understand that the word science means knowledge. 
And there's a big difference between experimental observational science, using your senses in the present to develop technology, which is observational science, versus talking about the past, which is historical science. When you're talking about the past, you don't have it in the present, it's your beliefs about the past. And here's what I found over and over and over again. When I, when I read about these theologians, Christian college professors, Bible college professors that believe in millions of years and say the days aren't ordinary days, they will say things like this. Yeah, if you just take the Bible as written, it seems to say six days, but it can't mean that. Why? Because of science. What do they mean by science? Man's beliefs in millions of years. Let me give you a couple of examples. By the way, I'll show you a number of videos uh, here, video clips. I'm, I'm not I'm attacking these people personally. I'm not saying they're not Christian or anything like that. I'm not saying anything like that. He, here's what I want you to see. That even people you might highly respect or respect some of the books they've written and so on, people who are Christians, I want you to see that there's a problem here. And it's a problem that has invaded the church. Some of you might have heard of William Lane Craig. Who's heard of William Lane Craig? He's a number of you. He's said to be a great apologist today. And uh, William Lane Craig as research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology, uh, associated with uh, Biola in California. How old is the world? The best estimates today are around 13.7 billion years or so. Now, this is good, you see. I, I, this is a position I can embrace because there are people who, who will sit here and say, no, it's six and a half thousand years old. Um, that, that is not a tenable position? I don't think it's plausible. Uh, the, the arguments that I give are right in line with mainstream science. Uh, I'm not bucking up against mainstream science okay. in presenting these arguments. Rather, I'm going with the flow of what contemporary cosmology and astrophysics uh, supports. He's going with the flow of what the secular world teaches about the age of the universe, which is not science, that's historical science, which is their beliefs about the past. How about J.P. Morland, who's also a professor of, uh, at Talbot School of Theology, Biola University. Are there areas of difficulty? Yes, there are. There's evidence for the theory of evolution. And, and it's hard to square some parts of this theory of evolution with the early chapters of Genesis. Again. There's evidence for an old universe. Now, I happen to, to, to favor an old universe, but for those who hold to a recent universe and, and the days of Genesis are six 24-hour days of creation, that's a problem. Again, we haven't found a lot of archaeological evidence yet for a universal flood of Noah. No. No, or we find a billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. No, we don't find any evidence for a global flood. But you know, you see what he said? It, it, you know, the, the millions of years and so on evolution. It's, sort of a, it's a problem for the early chapters of Genesis. No, the early chapters of Genesis shows the millions of years is a problem. See, they work, the other, they work the wrong way around. This is what I find over and over again. By the way, we're so prone to do this because if you look at our sin nature, as described in Genesis, we want to be our own God. And, and the, the temptation to Adam and Eve was, did God really say? In other words, the attack was on the word of God. And we have that sin nature from Adam. We're going to question the word of God rather than question the word of fallible man. And that's my challenge to us. Are we prepared to stand on God's word and question man's fallible man? Or are we doing it the other way around? There's so much of a trust in man. That's why even throughout scripture you see this. Stop trusting in man. That's, that's what God was saying in Isaiah. Stop trusting in man. We've got such a trust in man. You might say to me, why is it then that so many of these great academics and, and people in our colleges and that, why do they believe in millions of years? I believe it's an academic pride issue. Because they know, if they come out and say, we believe in a young universe, God created in six literal days, it's only thousands of years, not millions of years, they will not be published in the mainstream journals. They will be mocked at and scoffed at. They'll be called anti-science. They'll be called anti-academic. They'll be called anti-intellectual. Because the evolutionists know they have got to intimidate the people in the church You've got to intimidate them to believe in millions of years because they've got to have their millions of years. The Lost World of Genesis 1. John Walton is a professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College. Uh, he was formerly a professor for 20 years at Moody, 
was interesting. While he was at Moody, I, I went to, I was invited once by a student actually who, it's interesting how I, I got in there to speak at Moody. And when I, before I spoke to the students at chapel, they got up and gave a disclaimer about me. And the students said that's the only person they've ever heard them give a disclaimer about. And then when I talked to the students over the lunch table and found out what they were being taught by some of these professors, I mean, it is so alarming. And I know they're trying to change things there today, but uh, take John Walton, who's now at, at Wheaton. In my book, I've tried to show that the, uh, the account in Genesis 1 is not intended to be an account of material origins. If that's so, the Bible has no narrative of material origins. And if that's so, then we don't have to defend the Bible's narrative of material origins against a, a scientific narrative because the Bible doesn't offer one. In that case, we can say, well, if the Bible doesn't offer us a narrative, we can look to science for the narrative. So he says, Genesis 1 is not a material account of creation. Okay, we said it's not a material account. So the Bible doesn't have a material account. So we look to man and his fallible ideas, his historical science, and we say we take his account because the Bible doesn't have one. The Bible does have one, and it shows man's account is wrong. But this is the stuff that permeates our seminaries. It permeates our theological colleges. His books are actually permeating many of our conservative seminaries. And then you have people like Dr. John Sailhammer. And uh, he was a professor uh, at uh, Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary in California. I'm not sure where he actually is now. But it's interesting. His book, he has this, he has this view. See, people come up with all these different views and they think, oh, we have got the way of fitting the millions of years in. And he's got this interesting view to fit millions of years in. And that is that the six days of creation are not six literal days of actual material creation account as, as given there, but it's to do with the promised land and all the rest of it. And, and then you read this in the book. The many biological eras, millions of years, would also fit with the beginning of Genesis 1-1, including the long ages during which the dinosaurs roamed the earth. You stop right there for a moment and you realize what he's saying is he's accepted the millions of years and millions of years for dinosaurs. He's ac accepting that. So by the time human beings were created on the sixth day of the week, the dinosaurs could have already flourished and become extinct all during the beginning recorded in Genesis 1.1. So we can say, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and we put the millions of years in there and we put the dinosaurs in there and oh look, I've solved the problem. Then this is all about the promised land and so on. And then it so burdens me then you hear people like highly respected theologians, pastors, like John Piper, who I highly respect, who is a wonderful man of God, but then listen to what he says. Or he might take Sailhammer's view, which is where I uh, feel at home, namely that what's going on here is all of creation happened uh, to prepare the land for man in, in uh, verse 1 beginning he made the heavens and the earth that's everything and then you go day by day and he's preparing the land he's not bringing new things into existence he's preparing the land and causing things to grow and separating out water and earth and then when it's all set and prepared he creates and puts man there and so that that has the advantage of saying that the earth is billions of years old if it wants to be whatever science says it is it is uh, see the problem? Whatever science says it is, it is. Wait a minute, it, it, that's not observational science. The age of the earth is not observational science. That's man's beliefs. And I'll show you tomorrow. Observational science, actually, it contradicts the millions of years. And then he goes on and then you, 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 you watch videos like this. John, do you accept old earth and evolution? Um, except, <laughs> meaning are there people on our council of elders who hold to old earth? Yes. Uh, meaning, is that my view? Um, what I said the other day when we were talking about this, we spent probably an hour on this as a staff uh, talking about how we as a church should orient ourselves in, in the conversation of old earth, young earth. Uh, I said there seem to be two viable biblical views for me, and this is going to offend a lot of people. One is young earth, because it seems to me that the natural reading of Genesis 1 
is 24 hour days. Did you hear that? The natural meaning of Genesis 1 is 24 hour days, but then he goes on and says, but, but science. Bruce Waltke, his books have had an incredible influence, his uh, Old Testament books, for instance, incredible influence on our seminaries and on pastors. And he was a former professor of Old Testament at Knox Theological Seminary in Fort Lauderdale after uh, James Kennedy had uh, passed on. I think that if the data is overwhelming in favor, favor of evolution, to deny that reality will make us a cult. And then this is where a lot of our younger pastors, I mean, Andy Stanley is said to be the fifth most influential pastor in America, in Atlanta, Georgia. And a massive church reaching millennials. And then listen to what he says. We really believe, whether you take it literally or figuratively, whatever, if we really believe that God is the creator of the universe, that all time, space, and matter, all time, space, and matter were created by God, and we take seriously what science has told us, that it all began with a singularity, that's what it's referred to, right before, there's not such thing as before the Big Bang, because before is time, and time began. So if we go to the singularity that was the Big Bang, that unfurled the universe, that continues to expand, and when religion and science conflict, at the end of the day, if you are an honest person, science must win. The foundation of our faith is not the scripture. The foundation of our faith is not the infallibility of the Bible. The foundation of our faith is something that happened in history. And the issue is always, who is Jesus? Well, you only find out who Jesus is from the Bible. I would ask preachers and pastors and student pastors in their communication to get the spotlight off the Bible and back on the resurrection. You know, the Bible says every word of God proves true. Do not add to his words. Here's what I have found in our modern era. When you take even many conservative theologians and academics and uh, if you have someone like Richard Dawkins who comes in and says evolution of millions of years they will say, oh, okay, uh, we'll add that into Genesis. Uh, but if they come in, like Richard Dawkins does, and says no resurrection and no virgin birth, they say, you're wrong. The Bible says resurrection and virgin birth. And you know what I found? That there's an intellectual schizophrenia. Because I found many of these theologians today, many of our Bible professors have uh, a particular... Uh, a view of interpretation of scripture for Genesis 1 to 11, a particular hermeneutical principle that they would never apply in the rest of the Bible. And what they're doing in Genesis 1 to 11 is called eisegesis. They're starting outside of scripture and adding it to scripture. What they're doing in the rest is called exegesis. They're starting from scripture. And if you wonder how many of these great men of God can't see, can't see the inconsistency here, that they're using eisegesis in this part and, and, and uh, exegesis, sorry, in this part of the Bible and eisegesis at the beginning, I think it comes down to academic pride because they don't understand historical and observational science and they've got this, this trust in what they call science. And people, we've got to challenge them to stand on the Word of God. I don't care how great they are, we need to challenge them. The revolutions come from the people. Challenge your Christian leaders, challenge your professors in your colleges, challenge your pastors if they don't stand on God's word and are starting outside of scripture. You see, it is an authority issue because what they're really doing is unlocking a door to say we don't have to start with scripture here, but you do over here. Do you know what happens to the next generation? They push that door open further and further and further until they say we can't believe any of the Bible and walk away from the church. I believe that has been one of the greatest attacks on the authority of God's word in this era.